also okay the format or? uh up and yeah what the way you have it now is great that's fine okay. yeah it, it it all adjusted or whatever mm -hmm. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. I have on two very interesting men from Europe right now who are going to talk to us about a different and new way of learning golf. Uh, recently, in golf teaching has changed quite a bit where, uh, and I'll let you guys know this too, because, because just to give you some in the background of golf teaching, Be Better Golf, I go around the country and the world interviewing different teachers about how, to, uh, uh, how people can be better at golf. And what it seemed like is when the video camera came out, everyone uh, got very positionally based. They wanted to really concentrate on nailing perfect positions. So uh, going back, so then the P system came out. So P1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 10. The diff those are different kind of spots in the swing. And people would like look at someone's a still frame of their swing and then a still frame of someone else's swing at a similar spot and say, that's the reason that I'm not good is because I'm not in that position. Then moving on, that seemed, uh, I think a lot of people found that to be very lacking and the improvement in golfers wasn't really connecting with the breakthrough that the teachers thought it was as far as, hey, now we have video and I can see exactly where I am. How come me trying to hit these positions better isn't really making my students that much better? Recently in golf, and this is where then the, uh, kinematics and the kinetics come together because people have been going a little bit more away from trying to hit positions and more into trying to create certain pressures in the golf swing. And then the positions become a result to that. Finally, the last thing I'll say before I inter in, uh, introduce you guys, just to give you this background. This is something that I really wanted to talk to you, you guys about because the thing that I always explain to my students is you want to do things in real time, like as you're doing them. Imagine if you were uh, trying to learn the piano, which I know um, you're super great at. But if you're trying to learn the piano and you you played your notes, right, not hearing anything, but you played your notes, stopped, walked over and about like 30 seconds to a minute later, you heard the notes you did. And then you came back and you're like, OK, let me make a correction based off of what I just heard. You can maybe do it. But it would the learning process would be so difficult. And I think that's kind of where golf is. So when I heard about audio golf, which is your guys product, and um, I'm always trying to get these tech companies when I because I, I do a lot of consulting for different like golf tech companies and things like that. I'm, I'm saying like that historical analysis is interesting. And it's like, it's good in that way. But if you really want people to learn, it's got to be happening like in the moment. So tell us a little bit about uh, your history and also then how you got into like, kind of trying to teach people a motor learning kind of way that's pretty radically different. JJ, should I start? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Okay. Well, again, my name is Chai. Uh, I am, uh, come from Toronto and um, uh, my mom made me take piano lessons when I was a kid. I wasn't too crazy about that, but you know. But, uh, but I was kind of okay at it. And then when I was 16, uh, 17, I decided I wanted to try to become an internationally renowned concert pianist. So at the time I went to the country where I was told I had the highest level of, of classical music, which was at the time, this was like, like 40 years ago, uh, West Germany, there was the West Germany then. And I entered a major music academy and discovered after about two months, I was going to have two big problems getting to the top. And the first problem I discovered was everybody at this academy was more talented than I was. It was the first small problem. And the second small problem I discovered was everybody at this academy was better trained than I was. Okay, so just, you know, two, two tiny problems. And that was just this academy in Germany. We're not talking about, you know, London, Paris, Moscow, New York, and the, the rest of the world. And it became immediately clear to me that uh, practicing seven, eight hours a day is maybe going to get me ahead, but it's not, but, but all these other um, uh, students, uh, everybody else was so far ahead of me, I, it wasn't going to work. I wasn't going to be able to pass them because they're working seven, eight hours a day too. So, so when you were when you were 16, about what level had you gotten to kind of on your own before you left Canada? Like if there's if we were to put it in golf terms as far as like, you I know, would say I had uh, maybe like a, a 
12, 15 handicap. Oh, really? So you knew that you knew the basics, but yeah. you were you were so far away from being I was the, so elite, far away. the elite like that you Just wanted. So yeah, right? away. It was yeah. and it became very clear to. And uh, so um, uh, I, I started I had this idea basically and I didn't want I, I basically had two choices. Uh, first choice, A, I quit and go back home. Okay, and become a doctor, which my mom would have liked. <laughs> and uh, uh, the other was, was alternative I had was I find a shortcut or I find a quicker way, whatever you want to call it. And I and basically the idea was instead of practicing something for three months, which my teachers would tell me that's how long you need to fix this problem. I wanted the solution in 10, 15 minutes. That was it. That was my only chance. I was desperate. I'll be honest about that. And uh, so anyway, to make it a long story short, uh, we have in the international classical music scene also international tournaments. Uh, some of them that are, that are very, very big and, and, and prestigious, they come only once every four years. And one of these is the international piano competition in Sydney, Australia, held at the Opera House. And this is, uh, it's, uh, it's very, it's one of the very big ones equivalent probably to in your world uh, the british open okay so anyway four years later i'm 21 i win this thing okay and please i'm not here to to brag about my achievement it's not about that i think it's about um having a, a, a 15 handicap and four years later winning the british open that's what yeah. the story is and basically is and how i did it and and what these shortcuts are in classical music and uh, I'm professor now in the major academy in Austria. And uh, I pass these shortcuts that I developed for myself onto my students. And it works for them too. I've got students in all the major York orchestras in Europe, uh, including the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, Frankfurt, uh, Old Opera, Concerto Bob in Amsterdam. It works. And um, about eight years ago, I was, uh, a dear friend calls me up and says, hey, Chai, uh, I have a new boyfriend. I want you to meet him. Uh, he's running a marathon tonight. He's a marathon runner. So I said, well, I'll, I'd certainly like to join you and, and chat chat a bit, but uh, I'm, not running, <laughs> I'm not running with him this marathon. So anyway, this guy, his name is Mark. Uh, he comes off at the end of the marathon. He's, I think, fifth or sixth for about 800 runners, but he was really disappointed with his performance. He comes off and said, oh, uh, you know, at, at mile 12, I was too fast and at mile seven, said 21, I lost my rhythm and blah, blah. And I just said spontaneously, you know, Mark, I can, if you are a pianist or a violinist, I can show you shortcuts to play faster without practicing a lot. Okay. I, you, I, I, things I did myself when I passed on to my students, but you're a marathon runner and I don't know anything about marathon running and nothing. Okay. Yeah. And I was going to change the subject. And this guy says to me, tell me, Chai, what would you tell me exactly? if I were a violin player or a cello player. I said, well, that's an interesting idea, applying a classic music shortcut to an athlete. So we met up a week later, we decided to test it on a kilometer, and which is about 0 0.62 miles. And uh, Mark runs his kilometer, I'm beside him on a bike. He runs it in three minutes, 20 seconds, okay? And then I gave him a sound pattern, which I would give one of my students, if they have to play a scale or something faster than they probably normally could. And it took me 10 seconds to explain it to him. We practiced it together for about 20 seconds and he runs back. And he crossed the finish line. I said, hey, did this help? Did, did you notice any, uh, you know, any, any difference? And he said, yes, I'm faster, 18 seconds. So he'd gone from three minutes, 20 to three minutes, two seconds. And it taken us two minutes to do it. And we were both like, just, you know, like just blasted. We just said, how is this possible? How can this be possible? So we started researching it. A word got around. I was asked by the Austrian Tennis Federation to coach the juniors. And uh, yeah, and about uh, five, six years ago, I'm in Berlin holding a, a seminary for, uh, for a running club. And this gent one here, JJ, comes up to me at the end. I'd never met him before. And he asked me, would this work in golf? And I said, well, I've done it with uh, uh, ski jumpers, marathon runners, uh, you know, bike, bikers. Uh, I guess so. It wor it's worked with every other sport until now. And so we tested it for about a year, and here we are. It works. 
And to me, it was kind of obvious because um, Chai was always talking about rhythm, tempo, speed. And if you think about it, these are the, the core elements of a golf swing, rhythm and tempo. Yeah. So it, it was pretty plausible to me that when you, when you want to teach rhythm and tempo, which so far is quite difficult in golf, you might want to ask an expert about rhythm and tempo from the musical area. Yeah, absolutely. So what have you what have you seen? Like, give me an example for like, uh, so not even to get into golf yet. Give me an example, like in the running world, like what that would mean. Would that be like during your whole race, you're you're saying this rhythm in your head and trying to run to, to that or what, what would it mean? Well, it, uh, uh, it depends on the on the distance. For example, uh, for like a 400 meter a sprint, OK, you would get a different sound like for a marathon because yeah. the 400 meter sprint, you can't hold this. Uh, you can't hold this um, this thought. Um, how do you say constantly in your head for, for two hours. You can't do it. OK, right. the, uh, the, the sprint uh, for a marathon, it's a different sound pattern. But if you want, I can give you a very good um, example right now, which you can probably experience right here, sure. even in the studio. And this comes actually from tennis. Um, I, like I said, a word got around. Uh, I was I was researching the first year. I was doing this uh, sports and 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 sound project, and the president of the tennis federation here, where I live, um, met me at a university fundraiser, and she said she had um, had a private dinner with Roger Fedor a few years back, and Fedor had told her that he had taken piano lessons for about 15, 16 years, and he had. Um, built a lot of his music into his game and when i heard this this got me really really going because it's the first time i heard that a world-class athlete was using something from sound in his sport and uh, clearly with fader it hadn't hurt him too much well in the in the women's game in tennis it certainly seems like they're doing that with because they're so vocal when they hit the ball and it seems like you know the ah but then they even make different kinds of sounds for the different kinds of shots. I mean, they some some of them get penalized for being distracting. But it oh, seems yeah. like that's beyond even um, just exertion. And there's some kind of uh, shape they're trying to hit with that noise. Yeah. Well. Anyway. So anyway. So the this, the uh, the tennis federation hired me as a consultant for two seasons. And uh, one one afternoon, the first season I was there, they were practicing something called um, uh, the drop shot at the net. Uh, which is uh, something they told me. I don't play tennis either. By the way, I want to make this clear. I don't play golf either, but I don't need to. Um, and the, the, the drop shot is you run full speed to the net and you take the ball at the net, but so relaxed that it just dribbles off your racket and just lies there. And the hard thing about this, they tell me, is this immediate switch from full speed run, okay, running full speed to the ball and then taking the ball in a very, very relaxed way. OK, and these uh, top juniors, they were coaching that day, uh, they're running to the net and they're taking the ball, but they've got so much, you know, inertia and energy. The ball's going back like 25, 30 feet. OK, yeah. and it's very, very difficult. And the head coach is saying, you know, relax your arm, relax your wrist, just relax. And, uh, you know, Mr. Warf, when somebody is telling me to relax, like relax, 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 it's uh, not too effective. So anyway, after about half an hour, they're not getting anywhere with this. Uh, the head coach comes to me and says, "Try, how would you solve this problem? And um, the thing is, I said, well, look, I don't play tennis. I need to see the motion you want these kids to make. And this is where it gets interesting. I apply it to golf. When I see, I have this kind of a freaky ability. When I see a motion, any motion, I'm hearing a sound. That's if I hear, you show me a 35-yard pitch, uh, or an 85 yard uh, uh, pitch shot or, or, or a 40 foot putt, I'm hearing a sound. And I translate the sound into syllables and I give it to the player. And usually 99% of the case it works. So anyway, the head coach says, okay, when the kids get to the net, I want them to take the racket and pull it towards them when the ball comes to sort of absorb the energy of the ball. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's just absorbing the energy just dribbles off their racket but not stiff. And the last thing you want is for them to slug the ball. Okay. So I said, okay, if you want this motion towards yourself, you're going to need this sound. And the sound is, um, um, can you try it with me, sir? Um, yeah. 
Okay, that's not hard to learn, is it? Okay, so anyway, so the first kid runs to the net. I tell him, run to this net and go on. So the kid runs to the net, the ball's just lying right beside the net. Okay, second, third, they can do it on their first try, everyone. It's solved. The problem's fixed. Okay, so we know this works, but this is where it gets very interesting. Okay, I we think. Okay, I want you now to say, I say this sound, ah, um, and this motion are connected. Okay, I want you now to try to say, ah, um, but give me the exact opposite motion. Okay, don't give me this motion. Give me a very vicious backhand. Just rip it away from you, but say, ah, um, at the same time. I need to hear your voice. I was muted. Okay, here we go. So this is bunting it is um, um now say um but now give me a very vicious backhand. Um no you you said um and then get it. I want it simultaneously. Um yeah, you've changed the sound. You've gone yeah. from um to um. Yeah. Try it again. Try it again. Um <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it comes out more forcefully. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. basically this is the whole idea. If you say, I'm um, correctly, I'm um, okay. You can't, you can't rip it. It can, it can only come out soft. They can't. Okay. And this is where we think it's so interesting because the sound is so powerful. You can't consciously ignore it. You can't ignore it. And you can't, even if you try, if you tried right now, consciously override it. Okay, you just can't do it. We've been doing this demo for five years. We've never met anybody who can do it. It can't be done. Okay. So, and that's that's what the fascinating part about this is. So if I give you a, a sound pattern for like a 40 yard pitch shot, okay, you execute the sound correctly, it'll be 40 yards every time. By the way, Brendan, keywords for the scientific, scientific rationale behind all this is uh, sonification, where you use sound to um, to manipulate motor motions. And at the same time, if you look at the brain structure, you have on one side brain centers for sound and rhythm, and on the other hand, centers for motion. And if you put an, a brain into an MRT device and play music to it, then you see not only the, the sound centers firing, but at the same time, the motion centers fire too, as if they want to tap already to the beat of the, the song. Yeah? Sure. So that's why when we hear, for example, extreme sounds like screaming or so on, we immediately um, are attentive or run yeah, without overthinking it. Okay, cool. So then, like, if somebody's playing golf, would they have a, like, a, for example, the drive seems to be the thing that, that gets people most, um, uh, gives some people the most problems with, with you know, because you, you, if you can't drive the ball, you know, generally where you want, you're just not even playing the game. You're in someone's backyard or in the woods or something. So if I'm just thinking, uh, in the future, if I had like a certain, like I hit my driver about 13 or 14 times around, if I, and generally i want them to do the same thing i'm not really shaping it that much you know for mm -hmm. slicing and fading generally i just want it to go long and straight mm -hmm. yes um so if i had a sound that uh, that i because the problem is especially you know be very guy i interview all these different teachers they have all these different um ideas you're standing over the ball sometimes it sounds like a crowded restaurant you're like okay what am i supposed to do and in tennis and in baseball and in even soccer and things like the action happens and you respond to the action. Whereas like golf, like nothing happens until you do it. So that makes it, you would think that that would make golf easier because you have more time to do what you want, but it makes it more difficult because you can't just react like you would naturally. You have to turn this kind of this thing that you just do uh, into something that would look very reactive and athletic. So how could like a specific, specifically with driver, how could like a driver sound, uh, vocalizing and sonificating a driver sound, how could that help you, um, be faster and hit the ball in the center of the face more often and straighter? Well, there's, there's, there's hundreds of different factors. We've been doing this now for like for four or five years now. I mean, every, every player is different. And I would say that every pe people have problems have different problems. 
Okay, there are people who have problem with the transition. The people who don't take it f- far enough back. Okay. The people who are coming over the top. Uh, there's all kinds of problems, and uh, to and there, we have sounds to fix all those problems. Okay, uh, I must confess there are uh, we have uh, some players, and we, this is where it gets tricky. Where they, they're like in, in in a driver's swing, the instructor will tell us there's like six, seven different issues. Okay. I can give you a sound pattern that can fix two issues, okay? But not one that can fix six or seven. They're just, it's just too complex. But right. we get rid of two of those, and then we have the client come back in two weeks, and we fix two more, and so on, okay? But again, there's no standard um, sound pattern because, because everybody is different. And again, this is what I think uh, the beauty of our system is, uh, is that it's, it's tailor-made to everybody. Okay, I, 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 of course, I can give you, uh, I can give you what's, whatever, you know, John Rahm's uh, driver sound, but that might not help a person with a 15 handicap. But we can, things like going over the top, turning, uh, shifting weight, uh, you know, keep the hips straight and all kinds of things. Everything can be, can be influenced by sound. And the greatest part about it is that it's done without thinking. Like just with this arm thing, okay, this arm thing, it's a natural thing. You just do it. And golf. I'm oh, sorry. No, golf is for, for this for this metho- methodology the ideal sport because I worked with tennis players. I can give you a sound pattern that can increase the backhand speed, uh, you know, for for a backhand stroke. Okay, but if you're running like crazy, cross court just to get to the ball, okay, yeah. there's no time to prepare it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And golf is to load up your lungs and then make them make the noise and all that. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, there's, it's, it's, I mean, there's just all kinds of things. I mean, we've asked. I can do something for soccer or or, or, or basketball. Uh, basketball only works in a couple of, of of you know specific situations where a player has one and a half seconds to prepare it. Okay. So again, golf is ideal because you're never under pressure from your opponent to make the, the shot like now. Yeah, you're okay. not going to get tackled or anything. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Brenton, maybe we give um, you and the audience a very simple example to start with at first. So um, we have publicized a, a simple putting sound. And by the way, what do we mean with sound? We, we talk about phrases here, yeah? syllable phrases. And... Um, for distance control, specifically for a putt that should create a 12 to 15 foot putting distance, um, we teach a generic sound, and the sound is Yala Bam. Yeah. Chai, would you like to explain the Yala Bam, how to execute? Because like, uh, Yala Bam is, is, is a, what we call a generic sound. Okay, It's 12 to 15 feet. Okay, Of course, we're talking about a middle fast flat green. Yeah, and try. Okay, and it goes like this. Okay, this is okay. It's yala ben. You say yala the way you would normally say it. Y a hyphen l a yala. And when the sound stops, you stop. Okay, it's not yala. Okay, it's not yala. Yala. Okay, mm-hmm. and there's a rhythm built in. Okay, yala ben. Okay, yala ben. And the BAM, the B in BAM is the actual b- ball contact, is the actual putt. So you go, yala BAM. And basically, everybody's different. Some people might have 12 feet, some people might have 15 feet, but you should be, have incredible consistency with this putt. Okay? And you should be, you know, be able to really, really shrink the uh, dispersion to like, yeah, you know, less than a foot, a foot. Right. Maybe, Brendan, after the show, you want to grab a putter and try it for yourself on your carpet. Um, it works almost instantly. And um, the beauty of the, these phrases is that, for example, Yala defines the length of your backswing. Yeah? Obviously, for a different distance, we would create a different phrase that gives you a different backswing length. Um, BAM creates the speeds towards the ball. And the ratio from um, Yala to BAM is a two to one ratio. Yeah? You can actually measure it with, with milliseconds. Um, the two to one rhythm is a preferred rhythm in, uh, with two professionals for the, the shorter parts, right? And um, you just have to think 
these phrases. You don't even need to buy a device or anything else. It's as simple as that. You just think a specific phrase for a specific distance here in putting or in the short game area, and your body automatically synchronizes to this phrase. Yeah, it's like how your body synchronizes to different um, beats of different music styles. Yeah. It's I've ultimate. done a lot of like uh, putting research. I've, I wrote this book called Elite Putting about putting and stuff. And I found that the most important length to practice is a seven foot putt. So what, how would it sound different for a seven foot putt? Um, there is a different phrase to it. We would prefer not to publicize sure. it here. <laughs> okay. But so then, so, so that's, so you have this kind of a, uh, ammunition belt of different phrases for lots of different shots. Yes. Right. Well, yeah, you okay. know, uh, uh, Mr. Moore. So uh, it's, it's not just about, it's not just about saying yalla bem faster or something like no, that. Or no, 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 no. Right. Cause that, because that would be... the problem with that is the problem with that is saying it faster is again, if I want your natural voice, you were reading it. Y a hyphen L a yalla. How would yala. you say that? Okay. And I think even under stress in a tournament, you're not going to go yalla. Okay, or yalla. Okay, yeah. it's just the way you read it, yalla, and that's the natural speed. Okay, and the problem is if saying if you could say it faster, um, the problem is how would you control how much faster? Would you would it be like ten percent faster, forty percent faster, thirty percent faster? It's, these are really hard that's things right. to do. Yeah. yeah, that's why we have these natural phrases that you say normally. And again, this is something which is which we're told by many instructors, many players too. And I know this from my our life as a, as a concert pianist. Uh, the theory behind that is that a musician has a feel for tempo, and this feeling for tempo is based on your heartbeat. That means if you're relaxed, you're you know you're resting or whatever. It's one what it's normal 130. I don't know exactly. Okay, and you have I'm playing a piece whatever like 144 beats per minute or whatever. I have a feeling for that. Yeah. But if I'm stressed and I'm playing for 2,000 people, okay, or I'm in a tournament, okay, on the 17th hole, okay, and this really, this really means a lot, your heartbeat just goes right up, okay? Yeah. And, and everybody tells me that these, 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 these tour players, I mean, they get stressed and your heartbeat goes up and everything gets faster, okay? The drive gets faster, the chipping, everything gets faster, okay? And that's why this, this is, I think this technique is really good. And if you can probably experience right now, just imagine virtually you're making this putt, yala bam. Just close your eyes and imagine doing it. All right. Yala bam. Yeah. Yala bam. Okay. Now, yeah. if you notice one really important thing, in the 1.78 or 1.9 seconds, you needed to say yala bam. Did you notice something? Your brain can't think anything else. Right, right. It's, it's all yeah. Yeah. You can you can only focus if you focus on the sound, your body will follow the sound, and all these negative technical thoughts, stress thoughts, everything is gone for like like 1.8, 1.9 seconds, which we think is very, very effective. And this is something that I also help my music students with too. When you're trying to get a job and playing in front of a whole orchestra. Okay? This is to this is to think these things at these critical technical parts. Okay. All right. So that's why and it's not just a guide for the motion. Okay. It's not just, it's a 40 foot pot. It's a 65 yard pitch shot. It's a bunker. But in that moment, you've got this sound. And, and of course you practice it and you know, you can rely on it. And mm -hmm. uh, your mind is, is, is blocked in a, but in a positive way. So the way that it works, because you're, you're an expert at turning motion into, into, uh, sounds the way to, that it works is it like uh, you consult where with uh, a student and a golf coach and then the golf coach says like for example me uh if i was my coach and i was with you i would say hey look at brendan and see on the way back he instantly does this you know like it takes the disconnects the club and tucks mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and i want him to be more one piece and more with on the way back Yes. Um, is is that how this general process works? Like, you, or or do you go one on one with just the the person and they kind of tell you what they would want to work on? Or because well, part of the problem is sometimes people 
they think that they have a certain problem and that's not really the issue yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> yes well of course this is now we're on uh, really uh, shaky territory here yes we see this a lot but also it's in music too i, I see this in top music students too where they they, they say, think oh, they have a certain issue and that's not even their issue not the issue they're not the, what they're what they need to fix and they don't see but it's a classical thing i think in all, all professions uh, sure. but yes this is hard this, to see the forest for the trees when yes. Um, so what you were saying of, to, to fix, I mean, like I said, we, we offer two things, actually many things, but um, we can give you sound patterns for specific distances, for specific mm -hmm. swings. And the other thing is that we can qu quickly correct um, technical issues. But again, technical issues, which I won't see because I don't play golf. But sure. if your instructor tells me I want Brendan to do this, okay, Okay, and then I'll, I'll hear, I'll, I'll just imagine the sound. You should be, um, I would just, I would say the golf, tell the golf, uh, your instructor, show me the exam, the movement you want him to make. And I'll yep. take the sound for this and give it to you. And well, then, for sure, for, yeah, for sure. I mean, when it comes to like the draw, all full swing shots, unless you're doing something very uh, weird or, you know, for the most part, We'd like to have people doing a three to one tempo on the pull shots. And then, mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. on the short, on the short shots, a two to one. Mm -hmm. um, most people are doing like about a six to one, you know, really slow backswing and then trying to create all the speed too late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if you could, even if people were, you know, I think that would be an almost universal thing unless somebody's doing something pretty strange. But even if you could have some kind of phrase or something, I'm just thinking about like full swing shots, like tee shots and stuff. Um, have some kind of phrase that would more uh, that would make the chances of a three to one tempo go go up more. I think people Earth. would hit it yes. more yes. solid for sure. Like I said, we offer uh, for many of our amateur players, uh, we offer so called generic sounds like just okay. yalla bam. Okay, mm -hmm. like I said, it's twelve to fifteen feet. But if we have a, a very high end player who says, I want ex a sound for 12 feet and I want a sound for 15 feet, I'm not going to give him Yala Bam. Okay, right. we're going to tailor make it. Okay, it's going you know, to be made for this player. And everybody's different. Everybody's different. Yeah. And for example, for the, um, for the professional players, it's very helpful that. I mean, we get, we can't teach them to improve on the driving range or on the practice screen. Yeah. Um, what they are looking for is that they become consistent faster and that they can replicate this consistency when they are, when it counts the most, when they are under stress. So a recent example is that we trained a mini tour player, um, in leg putting in this long distance putting and, um, it works wonderfully. As soon as um, a player trusts these sounds, um, he gets incredible consistent. You can see these. Um, oh, yeah, you're showing a video right now with the Yalabam sound and you see yeah. the consistency that it creates. The, by the way, the, the player is not even aiming. Yeah, I've done this. I've done this drill regularly and it is very hard to get a spread that good. And then I saw another video you guys put up where it was like three different distances and each little pot of three balls were right on top of each other. Yeah. And um, there's another video on our Instagram audio.golf where Kevin Sprecher, one of the top 100s in the golf magazine teachers, mm -hmm. um, was even blindfolded and he was able to, um, create consistency for three different distances with three different sounds of which one was the Yalabam sound. Yeah. I interviewed this guy called, uh, Greg Chalmers, who's like one of the top putters on the PGA Tour over the last 10 years, so really good. And um, I was asking, he's got all these uh, technical and specific things to do for reading the line and everything like that. I was like, what have you found for distance control? And almost everybody has said this to me where they just haven't found a system that works very well for distance control. So they just say like, you really, that's just lots and lots of effort and time of uh kind of building in your own feelings and it, it, that be, that part of it becomes total total like touch and trust and uh this seems like uh could crack the code on on getting this. because a lot of, of what happens when we'll say like i don't know why but just halfway through my swing 
I had a thought that came in, in my mind that, you know, oh, maybe like, uh, don't hook it or, or like, don't leave it short or something like that, you know. And um, it probably happens in classical music as well. You know, you hear them, you like, I wouldn't hear a difference, but you would hear that they made a mistake or they were a little late on a certain yes. note. And you would ask them why. And they might say, I don't know why, but I, I kept thinking, don't hit this note late. And then I hit it too late. Or something well, like that. Yeah. In classical music, I mean, for you, sometimes within like 20 seconds, you have to play like 400, 400 different notes. I'm not making this up. Um, it's the general rule is once you start thinking, you're finished. You might as well stop. Okay. Once you start thinking, it's, it's over. And uh, yeah. as a non golfer, uh, just imagining that I have to make a putt, I have to, I have to do, think about distance control, I have to read the green, and I have to aim. Okay. But with a methodology, I'm taking one of those things out. You don't yeah. have to think about I'm, I, how do I, how hard do I hit to make a, a 25 foot putt? I know because I have the sound pattern and I've tested it. So all I have to do is just focus on reading the green and aiming, and the rest should be let easier. Me, let me ask you, uh, a Chai, about the zone. So uh, people have talked about this concept for a long time, and it's definitely it's one of those things that like it definitely exists but it's very hard to measure. And it's also incredibly hard to force yourself into what they call the zone. Yes. So the zone is experienced in a lot of different, it, it could be anything where you're like, hey, I was doing this painting and I was kind of struggling. And then I don't know why I just got in the zone and then I did this or um, certain, you know, a, a carpenter could get into the zone. And mm -hmm. certainly when uh, you see this in a, uh, you know, musicians, you know, great guitarists or rock guitarists or a, a concert pianist, they're closing their eyes and you can just hit, tell like this guy's in the zone. And same thing with golf. Um, I think only I've played maybe 10,000 rounds of golf, uh, but I've probably been in the zone seven times, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. I, I and I've, I've like sometimes you touch it for a little bit or you're, you're, you're in it for like three holes. But like as far as like being in the zone the whole time. And the feeling of the zone, like you said, is usually it's not totally thoughtless. Like it's not like a blank mind. There is for, in golf wise, like you have like some kind of little feeling, but then you're like, but, but then all your senses go extremely external, mm -hmm. you know, now you're seeing the shots and you're seeing where the ball should go. And you mm -hmm. really feel like you're playing the golf, playing golf, like externally, like a video game. Whereas when you're, the opposite of this the zone when you're just like uh, freaking out yes. everything gets shrunk really small mm -hmm. and you're like uh white knuckling the steering wheel really trying to control things so talk a little bit first about the zone for a musician and then how to get yourself more often in the zone and then how that might go through to athletics well um the, the, it's 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 a bit complicated. I mean, the literature I've read until now, I'm trying to trying to understand this myself. Uh, the uh, uh, neurology experts out there know more about this than I do. But there's this idea of you know left brain, right brain. Okay, this concept of like left brain is responsible for for logic, mathematics, organ you know organized thinking, and right brain is for emotion, intuition, and creativity. And uh, as far as I'm informed the, uh, the, uh, the neurologists say that the right brain is this many, many, many times more powerful than left brain. But we in our, in our society uh, want everything to be controlled left brain. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like, I want to send you a, 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 a video, a three gigabyte video, but I'm going to use a 24K modem to send it to you. That's basically my analogy. And uh, again, you have to practice all that. My students have to practice these things daily to understand the motion, to you know secure the motion. But I always tell them, once you get on stage, that's all gone. You don't, once you start thinking about these motions, your brain cannot keep up. There's just too, it's just too complex. Right. And I think it's this idea of, of but we can we can philo philosophize about this for for days. I think the idea is, is to practice and practice and practice. But at that in that critical moment is to let go. Okay, and I think I was able to uh, with my my shortcuts, my faster ways that I developed myself at uh, competitions. I was able to 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 rely. I know this is this is not going to I'm not going to screw up here. I know I'm going to play one of the most difficult pieces on in the piano literature, but I'm not going to make any mistakes because I know how to do it. 
And I yeah. think this is, this is a, a, of course, a bit different to play a Beethoven sonata, which is all set. Okay, but there's still thousands of notes you have to play and, uh, you know, have a, a day of golf where the wind's coming like, you know, uh, 20 miles an hour from the west and, you know, it's yeah. raining and all kinds of things. We'll have to adapt, That's, yeah. Exactly. But I think this this idea of being in the zone is basically, um, it's about letting go and trusting yourself and, and not thinking. I think once you start thinking consciously, that's where problems start. But that's my, that's my right. personal theory. Right. But you can't be uh, like, because I've tried before to play golf just like without thinking at all. And that seems to be bad. It seems like there's a, you need some kind of skeleton of a structure of something to think about. Maybe like a little reminder in the back of your head or something like that. Because if you go totally blank, the ball just seems to well, know, again, lose control. As I understand that, of course, you have to play strategically. You have to make, I need to make this shot. I, 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 should, I, I don't, I, you know, I have to pull it off to the right a bit or whatever. Yeah. What I'm talking about is this, this, this maximum two seconds. Yep. That you're actually making the shot. My, mm -hmm. my idea, okay, is that yep. two seconds you're actually making the shot, turn it off, which is, of course, very difficult. And that's why I, instead of having a golfer turn it off, I'm stuffing his brain with a sound pattern. Okay. which will block him and maybe allow this, this creative, these things, these practice for 10,000 hours to come out uninhibited. Yeah. There's an article on golf.com about audio golf and, and the zone. And mm -hmm. um, basically um, what it says is we, we cannot influence with audio golf what you think between two strokes, which is the longest part of the game. Yeah. But um, audio golf directs the focus when you do the swing in the one and uh, one second or 1.5 seconds of your swing. And it separates, it distinguishes between internal, external, neutral focus, internal focus being, you think about a technical aspect of the swing, external focus, you think about the goal, for example, neutral focus, you think about your something else, which is not related to the game. So what our audio golf, what an audio golf phrase does is it gives you the advantage of a neutral, unemotional focus, yeah, but gives you a thought that is useful. It's guiding. Yeah. Yalabam contains all the technical information that you need to perform a 12 foot putt, but it's not technical thinking that is required from you. Yeah. And um, at the same time, as Chai said, it blocks your mind for that one and a half seconds since the brain can only have one thought at the same time. And so for that one and a half seconds, an audio phrase can put you in the zone. <laughs> and yeah. um, many of our students tell us that they are then moving up an upward spiral because that they then experience more consistency, dis dispersion decreases, and this improved consistency improves their confidence, yeah? which is another factor to be in the zone, I guess. Tell me a little bit about, I, you guys did um, some, or had commissioned, I'm not sure, some studies about, about this working with golf. What were some scientific papers or studies was there something that I read on your site about that? JJ? Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I think five or six years ago, we met a, um, a very interesting researcher, Dr. Fran Pirozolo. And um, what is very interesting about him, he's not only a um, psychologist, he's also a mental trainer to sports, sports people. So, for example, he trained the New York Yankees for a couple of years, won the World Series with them. And so um, we approached Anders Ericsson, who is the originator of the later coined 10,000 hour rules of um, um, directed training. And so Fran Pirozolo was himself already doing research on sonification. And he was very interested to do a study on, um, on audio golf. Um, at that time, we called it accelerates, by the way. 
Yeah. So he had put up a study design, Chai helped me, I think it was at five research centers. So for example, UCLA, Northwestern University, and so on. And Chai traveled there, trained the, the, the college team coach at each location in three um, different issues. One was a, a putting issue, second was chipping, third one was the drive consistency and so um, the local coaches then train their students the subjects of this study and together the study had 49 subjects and um, the and friend Pirozolo then evaluated um, the results and they were very um, significant and part of these results were then publicized um, by one study participant um, at the, what was it, Chai? The American Society of Neurology. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, so, the, so they think it, uh, yeah, they were showing how this, this mental uh, aspect improved golf performance or at least made it much more consistent. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the pandemic then stopped the, the process of, of writing the report or completing the report. So, um, unfortunately, Dr. Pernzola hasn't finished that yet. Okay. And uh, in that it, it did three different, it did three different shots over these 49 golfers to see how, how much better they got using compared the to the, or to, to the regular PGA approach to teach these three oh, I see. Um, yeah. challenges. Well, this is great. All right. Th uh, thank you so much, guys. I think the only thing left to do is to prove it to be better golfers is I think that w that we should uh, offline in top secret um, meetings, you know, uh, we should we should meet and, and talk about how I, I, I everybody knows my before because they've been watching me play golf on this channel for 10 years now. Um, and they know the couple things that I struggle with. Uh, one thing in particular, uh, and I'd like to do it before and after with you guys and, and go Love. through these sounds and develop Love. a top secret sound for myself. Yes. And um, then I can see if I sh uh, do a better score on the track man combine or uh, playing golf, if I can actually hit the ball straighter. And uh, I wish I was as confident about it as you guys are, <laughs> because that, that would be super exciting for me, because I have been literally to dozens and dozens of people and um, trying all different kinds of things and very open-minded and uh, with sometimes scattered results. We initially uh, got connected through uh, Dr. Kwan. And when, when Dr. Kwan, who I've done about six or seven different Be Better Golf Schools with Dr. Kwan, and I've had him on the channel a lot. And Dr. Kwan, when he's working with people, he is really trying to get people to listen to the sound of the whooshing of the club to uh, do continuous swings is, is one of the things that he does a lot because he tries to get people to be more reactive and stuff. I could see this working with the foot pressures and the things that uh, Dr. Kwan and some others do uh, really nicely, especially because a lot of golfers, um, and this would be one fault that would be interesting to fix. It's, it's not the, the fault I have, but 90% of golfers with driver, they go to the right side and they stay on the right side and just swing from over here, you know, so it'd be interested to kind of map out a certain different kind of movement pattern. Would you guys be up for that? Or see, seeing a before course, and after, a better golf before and after? Cool. I, we accept well, the challenge. No problems. All right. <laughs> and and um, may I use the occasion to thank Dr. Kwan that he put us in touch with you? Of uh, course. Yeah, of and, course. Yeah, he's uh, for a scientific guy. He's very open minded. He's, he's up. He's up to anything. There was something similar, I think Dr. Kwan thought of me, because there's something similar that Dr. Kwan and I have been working on, like a high-tech solution to getting people to, to train that uh, I'll tell you guys about later, that um, has kind of stalled. And this this could be a catalyst to, to get things moving again in that direction. So if people and are Chai, interested Chai in actually learning... actually presented to, um, um, to an audience at a conference that was very interesting called Doctors 4 in Orlando. Uh, it was in March. Mm -hmm. And um, Chai, Dr. Kwan, um, Dr. Bull, 3D 
bull system bull, yeah right presented and it was um f for us the first time that we realized um how f powerful the link between these biodynamic models um and audio golf could be because um even though the biodynamic models come up with m lots of data the brain is still analog and sure. it requires a bridge to to translate the recommendations that come off, out of this huge amount of data um, to a language that the brain can easily pick up and implement quickly. And, and yeah, that's what um, I was saying about pieces. the problem with golf right now is they have a lot of tech that's going into like what happens, but very little about how to get that good stuff to happen, where mostly what they do is they measure it. And then you kind of look at it later. And it's yeah. like, man, that's, that's, that's only academic, really. It's not really going to make it, make the good thing happen. This could be something that's very exciting for that. Okay, if Brett. people are interested in trying it, um, what what to, or or they want to connect more with you guys, uh, what should they do? Well, first of all, um, we always recommend it's better to experience it oneself than to read about it. So we we highly advise and recommend that um, interested parties download our little digital guide on the Yala Bam sound. There's a, a, a very detailed description how to perform the sound correctly. And where is that? Is that on your website to download? It's on our that? website. It's at uh, www.audio.golf or on our Instagram, audio.golf. Uh, where's, the the, where's the download for the Yala Bam? If you click if you click audio golf on the left side, the logo. Yeah. There. Yeah. Okay. Then scroll down a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit more. Yeah, there it is. Just get the free guide. Oh, okay. Exactly. So we just need your email and it would be great to have your postal code so that we know if you're in Florida in California or whatever, and then the system automatically sends you the uh, the digital guide and then just try it for yourself at home or next time you are in the putting green. And um, this gives the audience already a feel. Other than that, we offer clinics and private sessions in, in two locations. Um, right now in, in winter, we are in Palm Beach and in May we move up to New York and uh, teach at a facility in Westchester over there. <laughs> Um, we mainly work in private clubs, though. So, sure. um, um, and by the way, the concept is always to include a, um, a golf instructor to make sure that the mechanics aspect of the golf swing is um, um, taken care of. And um, Chai takes care of the, the rhythmical and timing parts, and that works really neatly. Um, yeah, please also. Um, Check out the many testimonials. Brett Faxon is a great supporter. Mark Ingleman is a great supporter. Um, Kevin Schreck, After almost uh, every great round. Right. Right. Awesome. Okay, cool. So go to audio.golf. You can learn more about that there. Subscribe to this channel and to see more updates with what we do. Thanks for watching. Bye. Take care. Thanks.